Welcome inside with the insiders. Tom Pellicero, Mike Garofolo, Ian Rappaport. I am currently at the Giants training facility in what they affectionately call it here, the Mike Garofolo room, uh, actually. Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to be one who looks out of place. Regular viewers of the show would notice only Mike is in his normal setup here. That's because I'm here, didn't bring a change of clothes. Everything else I own is vacuum packed in a suitcase over there. Ian, I don't know where you are. What what's what's happening over there? I am currently uh, at eleven Pen or Pen Eleven, whichever one is correct. I'm at the MSG building. I'm going to a um, Smashing Pumpkins and Jane's Addiction concert um, in about forty five minutes. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what songs they sing and um, doing this beforehand. I got. <laughs> I got 12 minutes till I got to leave to get to the Newark airport to catch a flight out of here. So let's get right to uh, the first headline we're going to hit. A lot happening around the league, but it starts out where all of us were in lower Manhattan yesterday at the NFL fall meeting. And we talked about it from first thing in the morning that there was nothing on the agenda about Daniel Snyder and the commanders. And really the question was going to be because of all the buzz surrounding everybody really within the league and within the teams, what, if anything, was going to come up during this meeting about Daniel Snyder? He faces five different investigations. He faces certainly external calls to give up the team. We did not know, and there were plenty of owners who walked by saying nothing. And then Colts owner Jim Ursay did this. You know, I believe that there's merit to remove him as owner. I think it's something that uh, we have to review. We have to look at all the evidence and we have to be thorough in going forward. But, um, you know, I think it's something that has to be given serious consideration. Jim Irsay followed that up with a tweet today saying you got to stand for something or you're going to fall for anything. A Jim Morrison quote from the owner of the Colts. It's a fascinating um, situation here, guys. Uh, and of course, just to explain the nuts and bolts of this, there's never in the 103 year history of the NFL been an owner forcibly removed. It can happen though, by vote of 24 of the 32 owners. Dan Snyder, quite clearly not going to vote to oust himself. So he would need to rally an additional eight owners to block that type of vote from going through. Jim Irsay, being the one to say this, and let's be honest, there's plenty out there about Jim Irsay. He has been, he's faced a battle with addiction. He's had an arrest. He has been suspended. For him to be the face for the owners of the we need to oust Daniel Snyder movement is interesting because then that raises the question of will other owners who don't have those types of things in their history need, feel the need to follow suit? At the same time, Roger Goodell told the owners that there is no conclusion to the Mary Jo White investigation, which covers a variety of different subjects, including workplace harassment, sexual harassment, one allegation of sexual assault against Daniel Snyder himself, as well as financial improprieties on behalf of the team. Uh, there's a significant amount there. Roger Goodell said nobody should be speaking about this. Jim Irsay powered through anywhere. Anyway, uh, Mike, I'll start with you here. When you listened to Jim Irsay's words and you caught the tenor in the room yesterday about Daniel Snyder's future with the Commanders, is there a future for Dan Snyder in the NFL? Uh, I don't think there's a long-term future, and I don't know enough of the ins and outs of the legal process uh, to tell you whether if this thing winds up in court, because every expectation is that Daniel Snyder is not going to go quietly and I had an exchange with some Twitter followers, so I'll, I'll rehash here because maybe not everybody understands this. You know, yeah, if, according to the bylaws, if they get 24 out of 32 votes, yes, Daniel Snyder, they could potentially force him to sell. But like everything we've seen with the NFL in recent years, it's possible it winds up in the court system. And I would expect that that would be the case for Dan and Tanya Snyder and that they would not go quietly. I know that that's the hope for Jim Irsay and some of those owners that – He'll just say, well, you know what? I think I'm licked here, so I'm just going to go sell the team and bounce a la um, Donald Sterling with the Clippers a couple of years ago. The difference is, you know, Donald Sterling was much later in life, was caught on tape saying something uh, that was pretty clear should not be said of an owner in the NBA. 
Dan Snyder has continually fought for his innocence. Now, he certainly has made changes within the organization and has made it clear that previously the workplace environment wasn't as good as it should be. But look how far we've come in the last couple of years. Well, that's not enough for some people uh, inside that room, and neither is the uh, financial malfeasance that you see on your screen there, uh, if that is proven enough uh, to, uh, for that room. So, you know, I, I don't think there's a long-term one. I don't know. I couldn't even guess to put a timeline on it. Let's say the Mary Jo White report comes out next month in December or March. The NFL owners vote, and they say, Dan Snyder, out of here. And then there is legal proceedings after that. I have no idea if we're talking months or years. I would assume years or year, something to that end. So I, I don't think there's a long-term future, but in the short term, he's going to continue to fight to keep his team. Catching all of the different eyes around the room as Ursay was saying what he said over and over as people had like 65 different questions for him was amazing from reporters to league people to Colts employees to anyone just walking by. There was definitely a sense of like, oh, my God, are you guys hearing this? Because I'm hearing this. And if he's saying what I think he's saying, then it means all the things. So that was certainly an experience yesterday. Um, it is so incredible because if you think about it mike like you're talking about the owners trying to convince him to sell okay well let's just play this forward let's say that they don't have a vote and they can't convince him to sell he's going to try to get a new stadium he's going to try to get a 200 million dollar loan from the owners guess what probably not going to get it right i mean what committees is he going to be on i mean i guess he was bounced from those anyway but i'm just saying like how if the owners aren't want him out and they're not going to cooperate with him, how will he just be as an owner? It seems untenable, right? You yeah. would certainly think so. And then you've got this this kind of back and forth yesterday where Daniel Snyder, shortly after uh, the comments by Jim Ursay through a team spokesperson, but it's clearly coming from Dan and Tanya Snyder, puts out a statement at length criticizing Ursay for speaking before the facts are known and then saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, that once the full report is out, Jim Mersey will see there's no reason for the Snyders to sell, and they won't. And those last three words are the fighting words from Dan Snyder here. I also could not help but think back to 2013 when Daniel Snyder told a reporter from USA Today about the, at the time, the name of the football team saying, I will never change the name. You can use <laughs> all caps. Well, seven years later... And there's obviously an uprising within the country after the murder of George Floyd. And Daniel Snyder does exactly that and changes the name of the team. This is a similar level of an ultimatum, but on a far greater scale here. I think that intellectually, everyone knew we'd get to a place as a country where eventually that name was going to be changed. I don't know that anyone really believed as bad as it's been for decades in Washington that we would get to the point where one owner is calling out Daniel Snyder even before the facts and the report is out and saying, I believe there's reason to get rid of him and I think we potentially will have the votes to do so. This does not happen. This is extraordinarily rare for it to go to that level. And Mike, I also can't help but think, so you also have Daniel Snyder shortly after that sending a letter to all the other owners saying, guys, this is such a privilege to be in the NFL. By the way, that ESPN story about how I was having someone follow you, a private investigator, that's definitely false and it's defamatory, but we're all in this together. Let's say Dan Snyder somehow survives this and he still owns the team and whatever vote might take place, that could happen any time. The next league meeting's in December, but they could do this really whenever they want to. Let's say he survives all that. What support, and to Ian's point, what committees yeah. is he gonna be on? What type of pull is he going to have? At some point, does it get to that stage where it's in Daniel Snyder's own best interest for him simply to sell? He clearly doesn't want it, and he's a fighter, and he's an extraordinarily litigious individual. But when, all, when other owners are actively trying to push you out, that kind of fraternity that you were buying into back in the late 90s when Daniel Snyder bought the team, that does not exactly feel like a fraternity anymore. Yeah, and I would say this, too. Um, if you're a player looking to go there, you know, thing, things flow downhill, and that's going to be on your mind as a free agent. You know, I, I know I, I sometimes talk about this stuff, and then 
you know, money talks in free agency, and it still very might for a lot of guys. But if the money is equal in two places, and one of them is a, a team with an owner that has a lot of questions circling around him and can't get a new stadium built, do I want to play eight to nine games uh, a season in that stadium, or would I like to play in one of the newer stadiums that have been built around the league? You know, the practice facility seems like it's on its way, but. Let's see how long it takes that to get to completion. Um, this is – and a coach, okay? L l suppose they, they yeah. want to move on from Ron Rivera at some point in the near future and you want to bring in a coach. You know, the coach is dealing closely, more closely with ownership than the players are. So that's a, that's a huge impact on a coaching search right there. Uh, I'm, I'm with you on that, Tom. And, and you know, let's just – I don't think Ron Rivera is in trouble right now, but let's just say at some point over the next three years, we'll say that they have a new coach. First of all, it is not a job for everyone because Ron Rivera has been head coach, but also like team spokesman slash crisis manager slash person who comes out and discusses everything. Like these are football dudes, a lot of them. Like not everyone can handle it like Ron Rivera. Plus, let's just say from a football sense, let's assume that some of the Washington Commanders fans are a little over Dan Snyder and maybe not exactly all in on their football team. Well, like, if the stadium is not filled and they're not as loud as they are, or if they sell their tickets to opposing fans, which I'm sure they will, like, that hurts the team too. So all of these things, like, as I'm thinking about it, as you guys are talking, like, there's so many things that are affected when the owner is basically what he is that like i don't honestly know how they get out of it without him being convinced to sell or being voted out we all have a lot more to say on this subject i'm sure but there's a lot of other news around the nfl we want to get to as well actually it's gonna be you guys getting to it because jessica is currently waiting in her honda accord outside the building here so i gotta run i'll be back on friday here on the insiders yeah, mike yeah. and ian will take you around the rest of the league coming up right after this bye tom Welcome back to the Insiders, still in the plural, but we're only talking two, not three. Tom's on his way to the airport. I give him credit for doing the A block. I would have blown that off as well and just yeah, taken the entire would. day off. But, uh, you know, he won but it, listen, he gets credit for the start, right? Like, that's the way it works in the stats. If you're there for the first play of the game, you got the start. So he keeps his start streak going. Uh, Ian, I want to talk to you about Dak Prescott. We just got word just a few minutes ago as we're... Uh, taping this show here, Mike McCarthy saying he is fully medically cleared. Dak Prescott returning against the Lions. Your thoughts? All right. That's it. Uh, six weeks on the dot. Dak Prescott is back. See, Mike, I'm counting the time he got injured, not the surgery. If it's the surgery, that means it's a little less than six weeks. If it's at the surgery, if it's the time he got hurt, it's, at, it's right on the dot. So there you go. Dak Prescott officially back. Um... Which is good, because I think for the Cowboys, what's happened is, I think, pretty truly amazing, honestly. <laughs> it's They are still in it, and they are everything is in front of them, and their quarterback is back, and he's healthy, and they didn't do anything dumb and rush him. And I think the Cowboys training staff did a really nice job of not listening to anything and just making sure that he is ready. He's going to do about 40 or so throws tomorrow. Um and then we'll be good to go, and you hope this is the last we hear of Dak's thumb because, oh, my God, it has been a long month and a half talking about it. Yeah, I thought he looked uh, pretty good in that throwing session on Sunday before the game against the Eagles. About 15 minutes, ball seemed to come out just fine. He kept clapping, too, which I don't know if that was a signal to show you, like, hey, I'm, I'm good. Even after the game, he was walking up the top. Clapping like this? And he was clapping, yeah. He was doing it like that. No, no, he was – it was – there was contact. There was noise. Um, I, I, I made the point, and, you know, maybe I was just trying to find something to say during NFL Now when I made the point initially, but when he first got injured, I thought to myself, look, they look terrible in week one in a lot of ways. Maybe, just maybe by him being out, everybody else has got to pick up their game a little bit, right? We, we, we got to make yeah. sure that Cooper Rush and we support him and we play better defense and everybody's got to – do what they can offensively to support him. And then, so when Dak Prescott comes back, maybe you're much better than you looked in week one because everybody has raised their game in the meantime. Who knows? Maybe my I'm, point just to kill some time on air actually makes a little bit of sense. And maybe that's where they well, are. And they look a lot better than they did. Go ahead. Yeah, just real quick. 
they ran the ball great last week. Like, that was the best Zeke has looked and the offensive line has looked. I don't know if they're yeah. going to keep doing this, but if they are, they literally will be better with him having this time because they're forced to run the ball. So anyway. Yeah, it's only a blessing in disguise if you can kind of keep it going while he was down, and Cooper Rush and the Cowboys certainly did that. Uh, elsewhere on the quarterback injury front, Mac Jones uh, slowly working his way back, was ruled out, then he was doubtful, then he was questionable, and who knows what he is this week. We'll see on Friday's injury report, but a lot of chatter that Bailey Zappi should be the guy. Ian Rappaport, I will let you weigh in on this one. Bailey Zappi has been amazing. Um, very Cooper Rush-like, I would say. Um, you know, it's. I think there was so little expectations when he came in. The fact that he has not blinked and been great is, is just an incredible Patriots thing. Um, I, I would say two things. One, um, injury report is Saturday because they play Monday night, so extend the drama a day. Two, I wouldn't be surprised if Belichick is like, you know what, he's not ready, and until he's 100%, why would we put him out there? We have somebody else who's doing fine. I don't know that Billy Zappi's done enough to take his job, but at the very least, it has made the Patriots think, and Mac had gotten a little careless with the football by the end, um, and I would imagine things would be a little different now because he knows what's at stake, and he has seen someone else thrive in the job that he believes is his. Yeah, I, I thought Kyle Brandt did a great job on Good Morning Football of explaining how this is not like Drew Bledsoe and Tom Brady years ago. Because yeah. everybody said, well, Mac Jones is the first-round pick, and he made the Pro Bowl, but Belichick benched Drew Bledsoe years ago. A as Kyle pointed out, that was back in 2001, the year before the Patriots had gone 5-11. and The year before that, 8-8, eight and 8-6. Eight, eight and six. Drew Bledsoe was not this guy that was lighting the world on fire. Yeah, he was throwing for 3,000 yards back when 3,000 yards was really a thing for quarterbacks. Uh, but it's not like he was the kind of quarterback that you just can't take him out no matter what happens while he's injured. Right. This is a much different situation. Mac Jones played well last year. He made the Pro Bowl, though I think he was an alternate and got subbed in there, however that happened. Um, r regardless, uh, I, I think it's still Mac Jones's job, although... If he doesn't play this week and Bailey Zappi throws for 400 yards, then maybe we can have a conversation. We'll see how this goes. But you know what? It is a good problem for the Patriots to have as they are still uh, yeah. moving on from Tom Brady. With, who, he's been gone for a couple of years, but they're still trying to figure out is Mac Jones the long-term guy or is it Bailey Zappi? We'll see. Uh, Saints, a lot of guys in that injury report. Uh, who did I see? Jarvis Landry, he's out. Andrews Pete, he's out. Michael Thomas is out. Uh, they said it's going to be a game-time decision on Thursday night as to who will be the starting quarterback. Uh, I don't know. They, they don't have practices during the week leading up, so you really don't pay attention too much to the injury uh, designation as far as how much they participated. I believe they were both limited yesterday, Andy Dalton and Jameis Winston. Uh, Ian, uh, your thoughts on who might wind up being the guy for the Saints against the Cardinals? I would be pretty surprised if it was Jameis Winston. I'd be pretty surprised. Yep. I've been surprised before, but I'd be pretty surprised. Andy Dalton's done well. He has a calming influence on this team. Um, Jameis is still not yet ready for a full practice. Was not last week and this week is sort of whatever. Um, if Andy Dalton wins, I mean, any, I thought he played pretty well last week. If he wins, then I would say he probably gets to keep starting. If he doesn't, then Dennis Allen has a decision. Um, it's weird for Jameis because he hasn't been fully healthy basically the whole year come back from the ACL and then the back injury, which was a pretty serious one. If he lost his job, it would be a little unfair, but you know, it is Dennis Allen's job to help this team win. And life is sometimes unfair. And if he loses his job, then it would be too bad, but things happen like that in the NFL, unfortunately. They do. We just talked about it with the Patriots. Hopefully you were paying attention yeah. during that chat, Ian. So we'll see. Yeah. We'll see where I can it goes hear you for James Winston and, yeah, we'll see where it goes for Jameis Winston and Andy Dalton. If it is Dalton, as you predict, and I probably am on board with you for that one, uh, has a chance to make a case to continue being the guy going forward. And, I, you know, I, I just, if, if he wins, and he, it, it's basically as long as he can stave off Jameis Winston. If it gets to the point where he's struggling, all right, let's go back to Jameis, see if that can provide us a spark. That's my expectation for how it's going to go for the Saints going forward. All right, we're coming back for one more segment in which we will discuss... Uh, our buddy Mark Ross, who wrote for NFL.com on some of the best offseason acquisitions, we have our own thoughts to go along with Mark. Stay tuned.
Don't blink. Don't blink, don't my blink, boy. Bro. Don't blink, my boy. Turn to my man Vaughn. Don't blink. Now listen, big homie. Don't blink. Listen. You can't blink in a fight, bro. Shit. Don't blink. Let's go, baby. Don't blink. Don't blink. We gotta keep going. Don't can't blink. Don't blink. It's on now. You just can't blink. Don't blink. Don't blink. Hey, don't blink. Don't blink. Hey, don't blink. Don't blink. Don't blink. Don't blink, my boy. We pros, bro. That's what we do, man. You know what I'm saying? That's what we do. My boy. Don't blink, baby. <laughs> we can blink now. Look. <laughs> we can blink now. Don't blink, uh, or you might miss some off-season moves. That's what we said in March and April and May, and I'm going to get to May in a second, as these things were happening all over the place. Man, it was happening fast and furious. Some of them had impact, and Mark Ross, our buddy for NFL.com, uh, backslash Ross, if you want to check out the story, talked about the best off-season trades, signings, acquisitions of 2022 so far to this point. And, it's tough to argue with anybody on that list, Ian, but you got to pick one. So who's it going to be? I'm picking Von Miller. Don't blink. Uh, I So Von Miller's going to the Bills was one of the more stunning moments of free agency. The contract was even more stunning. The fact that he left L.A., like I knew it, but I had to be double, triple short because I'm like, how could he leave the Super Bowl champs? And then the Bills being the dark horse to get him, I'm like, the Bills? That's interesting. And he has been great. He has been the closer, finishing out games for them. He's been a game changer. He's on track to have his best season in like four years. Honestly, considering the way it was kind of going in Denver, I didn't really see this coming. This is an incredible acquisition for the Bills. They have early returns, really, really positive. That is the correct answer. There's no doubt about it. I wouldn't argue with you at all for the impact that he's had, not only as a pass rusher, but also across the board. You see him in that uh, video we just showed of him talking to other players, his example uh, as far as working day in and day out all of training camp. They had to hold him back, actually. They didn't want him to overwork yeah. himself because he's a work, work, yeah. work, work kind of guy. Uh, so there's no question the impact of Von Miller. But I would say, if you look at that list, the one that stands out to me is James Bradbury because I talked about... March, April, May. I mean, usually the big acquisitions happen in March at the start of the NFL league year, but this was in May. This was when this guy was still available because, you know, it was a standoff with him and the Giants. Would he rework his contract to facilitate a trade? And Bradbury said, no, I'm not going to do that. Just cut me. This way I get a chance to go out and negotiate my own contract, number one. Number two, also pick my destination. And if the Giants were trading James Bradbury, Bradbury the Eagles would not have been the destination. So for Bradbury to wait it out, and for the Eagles to be able to add a starting caliber corner like him to a secondary that includes uh, Darius Slay on the other side, uh, as well as C.J. Gardner-Johnson, whom they acquired, and I don't know if he was on Mark's list, but that was deep into the summer, um, it, it, you start to realize you've got experience over there. So you can't throw over there. you got to throw over here. you got problems throwing over here. Well, you can't throw back there, right? All of a sudden, you got all these veterans who... They are new pieces, but because they've played so much football, as a matter of fact, I talked to Bradbury about this last week. He said, we have so much experience and so much confidence that we've been able to gel and come together quickly. He said, it started to happen in the Minnesota game, which was week two. So incredible impact for James Bradbury and that Eagles secondary to this point. They're very happy with it. He's on a one-year deal. He might sign an extension. If he does, this guy might break it. Won't be Pelissero because he's not here to hear me talk about James Bradbury. It's on Ian's radar. Uh, but Pelissero will be back tomorrow. Tomorrow is one of the days Maybe. you can catch the Insiders Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday on your fast streaming platforms, your times and everything here. You can go on NFL.com, the NFL channel. It's on YouTube. It's everywhere. If you can't find the show, you're not good at the internet. That's the bottom line. For Ian Rappaport, to my left, for Tom Pelissero, who's already left, I'm Mike Garofolo signing off. Thank you for joining the Insiders. We'll catch you on Thursday. Yeah. Not Thursday, Friday. I screwed that up.